Good morning, fourth and fifth graders. This is new to me. This is the first time I posted a Zoom meeting. The picture doesn't look quite as good as it did with my camera, but um, the problem I was having is that I ran out of room <clears throat> in my storage to record a video of myself reading. So I am going to try Zoom, which we will be, I will be sending you guys a Zoom invite today for Friday where we can all get on at the same time and chat together. It's really cool. I've been doing it um, a lot the past couple weeks with um, other teachers. So I've been learning that way, which has been a lot of fun. Today, so I'm getting really excited. We're super duper close to the end. I am going to try to finish this in two days. So by tomorrow, hopefully, tomorrow is gonna be a really long read. Um, <clears throat> We've been learning that good readers uh, make predictions based on text evidence, and we're going to continue working with, um, we're going to continue making predictions. So what I want you guys to be thinking is about how you think the story is going to end by using text evidence to make your predictions. Um, so I will model for you how I think about what I know um, in the knowledge, and use that knowledge to help me make a prediction. And notice how I use clues in the text to help me think about what's going to happen next. I'm gonna read pages 256 to 269 today. Wednesday, January 1st through Tuesday, January 7th, 1777. It is with much concern that I am to inform your Lordship the unfortunate and untimely defeat at Trenton has thrown us further back. Then, sorry, let me reread that. It is with much concern that I am to inform your Lordship the unfortunate and untimely defeat at Trenton has thrown us further back than was at first app apprehended from the great encouragement given to the rebels. From British General William Howe writing to Lord George Germain, Secretary of State for American Colonies after the American victory at Trenton. This quote tells us that the Patriot Army defeated the British Army at the Battle of Trenton and that the victory is given the Patriots renewed encouragement. Chapter 40. Just after the new year came, word of another shocking victory for the rebels, this one at Princeton in New Jersey, Washington's troops chased the British from the battlefield, killed a passel of them and took a couple of hundred prisoners. Folks could scarce credit this neither. Colonel Hawkins let out a roar in the study when the news was delivered and hit the unfortunate messenger on the head with a rolled up mat. Then he called for his horse and galloped off to headquarters. Within a day, the British promised boiled peas and rice with butter twice a week for their American prisoners, but they still did not allow fires in the Bridewell cells. The men had to eat the meat raw. Their chamber pots froze solid at night. The master's trip to London was moved up so that he could deliver news of the setbacks to the parliament and king. Madame had finally accommodated herself to the notion of his voyage and had found a way to turn it to her advantage. Whilst we prepared Lofton's clothes for the journey, she wrote out long lists of items she wanted him to buy in England. I kept to the kitchen and cellar and woodpile when she was awake, but made my trips up island each day before dawn, looking over my shoulder at every sound, choosing a different path daily. The constant worry ate a hole in my belly. Curzon was stronger and told me not to fret, for he was not coughing up blood and his bowels were in fine working order, but he always asked me to come back on the morrow. The day of the master's departure, I roused myself extra early on account of I feared Madame might do the same. I deposited stale rolls and burnt hunks of pork on the windowsill of Curzon's cell, then crossed the commons on my way to the pump. There were a few folk out of their own early morning errands, all bundled in cloaks and blanket coats and shawls and scarves wrapped high. You there? A loud voice called out. Everyone stopped to look. You there, girl? Oh no. A British soldier hurried toward me. I relaxed some when I saw his face. It was the mountain-sized guard who had let me visit Curzon's cell when he was first in prison, the one who liked to eat. Having seen you round, he said as he neared me. I bobbed quickly. The rules don't allow civilians in the cells. He lowered his rifle to the ground and eyed my bucket. True enough, watch you bring him today. Red crust and burnt meat, sir. He wrinkled his nose. What about yesterday? Yesterday was kidney pie and stale almond cake, sir. He shook his head and licked his lips. Sorry, I missed that, I am. Wouldn't hurt to drop off a bite now and then to one such as myself, would it? No, sir, I answered, I shall remember that. 
He tilted his head to the side. Your master ever hire you out? It was common in those days for folks to hire out their slaves to make money. The slaves did not see the money, of course, but if I had the chance to work away from the prying eyes of madam, I'd be grateful for it. Yes, sir, I lied. We need a maid to clean out the cells. Dying men do puke out some terrible things they do. You're a steadfast girl. Tell your mistress we pay her the going rate for your services. I shall tell her, sir. He shouldered his rifle. I'm on the night watch now. The name is Fisher. Bring me around some cake and I'll keep an eye on your brother. Thank you, Mr. Fisher, sir. I shall. No kidney pie, though. Kidney sour my gut, so I'm being terrible. The master left for London with, such, with much muttering on the part of his wife. She did not take to her bed as I expected, but was driven round to the home of Mrs. Taylor to play cards and no doubt complain about her husband. While she was gone, Sarah birthed her baby boy in the cellar. I was sore tempted to sneak down the stairs and watch. I'd seen kittens and calves come into the world, but not babies. I had a powerful curiosity about it, but I dared, dated not. Sorry, I dared not. I kept water boiling for the midwife and stuck cloth in my ears to keep out the noise. When Sarah stopped hollering, I crept down the stairs to see the babe. He was a round-headed, fat fellow with big eyes and bigger ears. George, Sarah called him. You named him after the king, Hannah asked. Perhaps, Sarah said cheerfully. We never figured the colonists would hold on this long. My man was saying the other night that Meb the king should stop the war. Meb the babe and us might stay here, not sail home. Plenty of room here, he said. She kissed the baby's nose. A name like George is a good one on either side of the ocean. Shh, warned Mary. The next day, Sarah and her George moved to a house set aside for new mothers attached to the army. I was sad to see them go, for I had wanted to hold the little one and make him laugh. Lady Seymour wanted to hear all of the details about the new baby. I thought maybe I could visit Sarah and ask her to bring the little lad by. Something about a baby always brings old folks back to life. When I mentioned this notion to the lady, she just shook her head. Not until the pestilence has left my lungs, she coughed into a stained handkerchief. Heaven knows when that will be. Her health was changeable and flighty. One day, she'd feel strong and lively, and she'd eat three meals and drink a gallon of tea. The next, she'd lie ab abed with fever, looking so poorly it tempted Madame to order the coffin made. I went to place another log on the fire. Lady Seymour was lying propped up on pillows in her bed. She shook her head. No more wood. I am warm enough. Please sit down, Isabel. Ma'am, I would like you to sit down either in the chair or on the edge of the bed. I should like to talk to you. It was improper for a servant to sit with a lady as though they were companions, but she asked me direct, so I sat myself in the chair that was close to the fire. I could not figure what we needed to conversate on. She hadn't sent me for a newspaper or sweets for days and days. Had I displeased her? Thank you. She sat back and used her right hand to place her left hand in her lap. I will soon meet my maker, Isabel. I am a sinner in need of forgiveness. I relaxed. It was a pull of death that made old people go funny. Miss Mary Finch went the same way toward the end. Clouds would roll into her eyes and she would talk nonsense for hours. Me and Ruth just sat polite and listened. The trick was with eight old old folks was to be agreeable. We all seek forgiveness, Lady Seymour. I wanted to buy you, she said. I wasn't sure I heard that right. Beg pardon, ma'am? I tried to buy you from Anne after I first met you. She refused, and we argued like a pair of fishwives. I rather lost my temper, she chuckled. Hadn't done that for 30 years. I knew not what to say. She studied her useless hand. When Elihu returned from exile, I should have demanded you be placed in my household. I was horrified by your treatment. And, of course, your poor sister. But then the fire, her gaze returned to the hearth. I regret I did not force the matter. You would have suited my household. It would have eased her mind if I had thanked her for wanting to buy me away from Madame. I tried to be grateful, but could not. A body does not like being bought and sold like a basket of eggs, even if the person who cracks the shell is kind. Isabel, she waited some word from me. I did not know how to explain myself. It was like talking to her maid, Angelica, who was so much like me and at the same time so much different. We two had no string of words that could tie us together. Yes, ma'am, thank you for telling me this. That was all I could muster. Forgive me, she said, I am a clumsy old woman. There was a shout from the drawing room upstairs where Colonel Hawkins and his men had been meeting. I stood, the soldier wives are all visiting Sarah. I should. Go on, she said, closing her eyes. When the book said that Lady Seymour told Isabel she was in need of forgiveness for not buying Isabel and Ruth from Mrs. Lofton. I made a prediction. I think Lady Seymour is going to die. And I also think that when she dies, Isabel will try to escape slavery.
Colonel Hawkins was in a right foul mood on account of all the forces he had to fill out and reports that were late. The war seemed fought with as much paper as bullets, what with the letters and the passes and permissions piled on the table. O orders received and recorded, recordings of conferences noted down. When I entered, he hollered that the room was colder than a barn and called me all manner of rude names. I chose the word for his fire very carefully, the greenest, dampest, sorry, I chose the wood for his fire very carefully, the greenest, dampest logs in the entire wood pile, guaranteed to smolder and sputter without giving off any heat and even less light. After a frigid hour, he left for headquarters. It took all my might not to crack a smile. The grandfather clock ticked off the minutes. Madam would not return home for a goodly while. She was a terrible card player, but she had loads of money to lose, so her companions would keep her at the faro table as long as possible. I peeked in Lady Seymour's door. She was wrapped up in her coverlet and sleeping. The blankets barely moved when she took breath. I pulled out common sense from its hiding place and read by firelight. In truth, there were some pages that I jumped over, for I found it hard to figure their meaning. But I gathered many of his thoughts. Americans had good cause to overthrow their British masters. A person born to wealth was not born to rule over others, and t'was good and proper to fight injustice. I kept the mending basket close to hand in case I needed to hide my crime. Chapter 41. Tuesday, January 7th through Wednesday, January 15th, 1777. It is not in the power of the smiles or frowns of Her Majesty to affect me either by conferencing pleasure, conferring pleasure, or giving pain. I was wholly incapable of taking the place she seemed to assign me when I was presented to her. I suppose she assented to the assertions that there were no people who had so much impudence as the Americans, for there was not any people who bred even at courts who had so much confidence as the Americans. This was because they did not tremble, cringe, and fear in the presence of majesty. Abby Adams, daughter of Abigail and John Adams on meeting Queen Charlotte of England. This quote tells us that the American people do not respect the power of the king. When Madame woke the next morn, her first command was for hot scones. Her second was that the seamstress must be fetched immediately. The British commandant was throwing a ball in honor of Queen Charlotte's birthday in 10 days of time. Madame required a new gown for such an occasion, perhaps two. I learned of all this when I returned from the market with a fresh kilt chicken. Hannah, who had taken over the boss lady job from Sarah after the baby was born, was preparing a cherry pie. Mary sat by the window, mending one of Madame's skirts. The notion of a ball for a queen confuddled me. That's a long voyage for a celebration, I said. Hannah laughed. No, you ninny, the queen isn't coming. How could she? She's got 10 children to take care of, plus all them castles. 11, added Mary. She popped out a new one last spring. Even though the queen can't come, the officers always hold a ball in her honor. Hannah said as she rolled out the pie dough. Gives them a good excuse to eat too much, drink too much, and make proper fools of themselves whilst, whilst dancing. Hold out the feather bag and a basin. And Madame Lofton is attending? The colonel will be her escort. Mary bit her thread in two. All the rich folk will be there. I ripped a handful of feathers from the chicken and stuffed them in the bag. Does Madame require anything of us? Not yet, Hannah said, carefully laying the dough in the pie plate. That will change, no doubt. I seen the queen herself, you know, Mary said, squinting at her stitches. With your own eyes, asked Anna, I don't believe you. Well, I seen her carriage and she was in it. The backside of the carriage, mind? Actually, the backside of the troops guarding the backside of the carriage. But I saw the wheels bent down to do it. She threaded another needle. Bet you don't know her name. Her Majesty, said Anna. Proves you're not a Londoner, Mary said. Her proper name is Her Majesty, Queen Charlotte of Great Britain, Duchess Sophia Charlotte of mecklenburg strelitz how do you remember all of them names when you can't remember from one minute to the next how much salt goes into the biscuit, asked Hannah. Biscuits are not as important as the queen. I practiced her name from the time I was a girl, in case the day ever come when she saw me on the street and I could call out her entire gracious name. If I did that, her carriage would stop and she'd make me a lady in waiting on account of my good manners. There was a moment of silence while the two women considered this, then a loud outburst as they near fell over themselves in laughter. After dinner, Lady Seymour had a frightful seizure of the apo apoplexy. Looked just like one of Ruth's fits, except not with so much shaking. She fell into a sleep so deep, I thought she was stone dead. But every so often, she'd take a breath, and once she opened her eyes. When she woke the next morning, she could not speak nor move her legs. 
Dr. Destuge arrived and bled her and stuck pins in her limbs and gave her a bitter tea. In truth, there was nothing could make her better. I was told to tend her again as I had right after the fire. I fed her and held the teacup to her lips and wiped her chin when she dribbled and helped her with the chamber pot business. This last was most distressing for her and she cried. Then I wiped the tears from her face. I heard Madame ask the doctor plain when the old lady would die. The doctor could not answer her. <clears throat> I figured Madame wanted Lady Seymour to die as soon as possible, but not before the Queen's Ball. If the house was in mourning, it wouldn't be proper for Madame to dance with the Admiral and make mercy, make merry. A week before the ball, Madame ordered that Lady Seymour be moved to the parlor bedchamber downstairs so she could reclaim the largest bedchamber for herself. After two privates had carried the lady down and she was propped up on her pillows so she could look out the window, Madame called me upstairs. I want this room aired and the linens boiled, girl. It smells of decay in here. The work of the day was simple and heavy. Strip the bed, haul down the linens for to wash, clean out the hearth, open the windows and wash them inside and out, take the rugs down and beat them in the yard, sweep and mop the floor, take the rugs back in, close the windows and give all the wood a polish. When the chamber was clean, Madam told me to open the windows again and let them stand open all afternoon to make sure there was no lingering pestilence in the air. I did as I was told. The doctor came right before supper and gave Lady Seymour a potion that would make the night pass quickly for her. When she was ready for bed, Madam called for me to bring up a warming pan filled with coals and run it between the sheets because they were chilled and still a wee bit damp. I did what she asked and returned to the kitchen, dumped the coals in the hearth and crept under my own blanket. She called for me again. The sheets were still too cold for her liking. I refilled the warming pan, carried it up the stairs and warmed her bed. Then I stoked the fire in her hearth before returning down the stairs. The third time she called for me, I was sore tempted to dump the glowing coals onto her bed, let it blaze and ask if that was warm enough. But I did not. I performed the test she gave me. And when she called me, when she called a quarter hour later, I did it again. If we were in class, right now I would want to know what you were all predicting and I would ask you to turn and talk but we can't do that so I'm just going to keep reading. <clears throat> A couple more pages. The sun rose bright the next day catching in the icicles that hung from the eaves and jumping off the snow like a mirror. The linens pegged out on the line were froze stiff as wood and covered in a lacework of ice. The clouds scuttled away and the sun blazed turning the yard into a garden of jewels. Ruth would love this if we were free and at home in Rhode Island, and these were our sheets and our laundry lines and our snow. She danced like an angel. The pictures in my brain pan caught me by surprise. I could not clear them away. She'd clap her hands at the side of the frozen laundry. She'd twirl in the spinning swirls of snow that lifted in the breeze. She'd plunge her hands into the bushes to pluck off the diamond. She would do all of these things and laugh, and the wind tossed a handful of snow in my face and washed it all away. Ruth would not see this, never. I dried my face. Why was I thinking of Ruth? I'd worked hard to pack her away from my mind, along with the thoughts of Mama and Papa and the life Ruth and I were promised. Didn't help to ponder things that were forever gone. It only made a body restless and filled up with bees, all wanting to sting something. I kicked at the new snow. It rose up, a sparkling diamond breeze fit for a queen. It was Lady Seymour who did it. Her, her with her begging forgiveness for not buying me and telling me I'd have been a good slave for her. Her with her wet eyes and skeleton hands. Did she never think about setting me free? That would be a fine question to ask. Of course, there was no sense to asking it because her mouth didn't work anymore. I carried the big laundry basket out to the sheets. I'd have to hang them in the kitchen else they wouldn't dry till spring. Another picture hung itself in my mind, the poetry book in the stationer shop, the one I'd been afraid to read. Miss Phyllis Wheatley went free when her master released her. It was on account of her fame, Mama said. Master Wheatley looked the fool for keeping a poetical genius enslaved in his household. I'd heard of other slaves who bought their freedom, folks who were given their Sunday afternoons to work for themselves, who saved their pennies and farthings for years and years until they had piled up the 150 or 200 pounds to buy their body and soul from their master. If I had Sunday afternoons free, I'd figure a way to earn my pennies. I could sew or hire out to scrub stables. I'd even clean the cells of the bridewell like that guard asked. I took a long stick from the pile of kindling wood. It would never happen. Madam would not allow it. She was set on keeping my arms and legs dancing to her tune and my soul bound in her chains. I pulled the stick back and cracked it against the side of the frozen bed linen. The ice shattered and fell to the ground, tinkling like pieces of falling stars. 
Oh, we've been learning that good readers make predictions based on text evidence, and you've had a lot of, well, I've modeled making predictions, and hopefully you guys have been making predictions from home as well, um, as you either are listening to me read or finished reading on your own. Um, today, I'm going to ask that you write your predictions in on um, Google Classroom, on a Google Doc. I will start up a new feed and then you can add it to that. Um, I actually, I'm, I'll create an assignment for you to add and send in. So it's just going to be called end of book prediction. And the way you can start it is I predict Isabel will blank because blank. I don't want it to just be a sentence though. I want you to use several pieces of evidence to support your thinking. So what are you predicting and why? and then using evidence from our text to back it up. I can't wait till you finish reading tomorrow. I hope you guys have a great day. Let's see if I can figure out how to close this.